Hello, my name is John Newbury, and I know that every Tom, Dick, and Harry has been producing videos for the internet with their fly tying skills. And there's a lot of rock stars out there, but I would just like to present my techniques on how I tie my flies. I'm very particular about how my flies look. They should have a high quality aesthetic to them. I want them proportionate, well tied, strong, fishable, and frameable all at the same time. So I'm going to produce a series of a couple of videos to try to show to you the little subtle nuances that I use and the tricks that I use to execute the fly patterns that I design. And I will also hope to pass along in this series of videos designing your own flies, some philosophies that you can throw into it to come up with your own patterns that will look really good in a fly box and most importantly keep you hooked up on a consistent basis with fish of a lifetime. So please join me as I venture into a series of fly tying skills that should take and advance your ability behind the vise. The first thing I consider when I'm sitting down at the fly tying vise to come up with a fly, whether I'm tying a classic standard or just some creative endeavor, which steelhead fly tires are known to do, given the abundance of fabulous materials that we have to play with, is uh, where and when I'm going to be fishing this fly, you know, what season, and that will dictate to me a lot of times the type of hook that I'm going to choose. For example, now we've had a lot of rain here in Oregon the last few days, and in fact we've broken some record rain totals. So I know when I hit the river later this week, um, chasing summer steelhead in early October, I'm going to be needing a heavier hook, maybe perhaps a little bit larger of a hook, like uh, this Gamakatsu 10, T10-6H, so the H would be heavy, so this is a 6 heavy hook in a size 2. If I'm going to be hitting the river later and the water is going to be lower and clear, I might end up tying the fly on maybe a smaller hook. This still is a six heavy hook. If not, I'll go to even a lighter hook like this 3H hook in a size 4. Typically all of my steelhead fly fishing here in Oregon is on size 2's and 4's. Occasionally I tie down to a size 6, but for the most part these packages of hooks here are what most of my working summer steelhead flies are going to be tied on for the most part except for when I want to do a specialty fly but for the standard classic step swing cast fly fishing for summer steelhead I'm going to be tying in a range of heavy and light hooks from a size 2 to a size 4 and if I wanted to fish something more Along the surface, I might even go to a size 6 low water hook, maybe a different brand, but a lighter wire hook in a smaller size. But for now, um, I'm going to work with a size 4 heavy hook, which was this size 4 6 heavy Gamakatsu, which is a fabulous steelhead hook. Um, and we'll just place that in the vise. The first thing I consider when I'm getting ready to tie a fly is the color of thread or the type of thread that I'm going to be using. Um, for, for this fly that I want to tie today, for starters, we're going to tie a classic Steelhead General, also known as a Dell Cooper. Sometimes if you reverse things and put a purple hackle there and a red body, it could be a Dave's mistake. But this is your classic gen general all around archetypical harrowing steelhead wet fly. And you notice that here I have a red head on the fly. So I want to choose a red thread. I like to color match my threads to the flies, make them you know, prettier than just a standard black head. Uh, I could use here this Ultra 70 Denier fluorescent fire orange. But typically I like to tie with the good old fashioned Danville 6 aught. Either way, these two threads will do very nicely. And when it comes to tying a nice clean head, 
both will work very well. But for starters, I like to uh, find an area where I know that I'm going to be planning ahead. And I know that in my proportion, I want my tail to start originating from the fly just above the hook point right here. This then will be my body, and I want my hackle, my last bit of hackle to end right here on the hook, giving myself a couple of millimeters to work with to secure the wing and my head. So in order to mark that location out, I'll start my fly tying wraps at the spot where my last turn of hackle is going to take place. And I'm going to try to focus this in real tight here for you. But you can see here, I've left a little bit of space at the front. That is a guide for me to where I cannot tie beyond. At that point in time further, it's going to be wing and head. So what I'll do is I'll tie a nice secure base of thread all the way to the end of the return loop. And what that essentially does is it ties my return loop shut. As you can see, I spin my vise around a lot, and I like to tie in a rotary position because I tie 360. Materials are going to be attached to the hook in various locations. Um, one of the amateur, or I don't know if that's a polite way to say, the amateur technique is to start lashing materials on on the top of the hook where you're going to start winding them. So a little forethought is required if you want to tie a nice, clean, classic steelhead fly. A fly that's going to be durable as well. Less thread wraps tying materials in, more strategic thread wraps. And there's no need to pull out a bottle of Zappa Gap or glue. You don't need to glue anything in the process of tying a steelhead fly. That's lazy, and you end up actually tying a weaker fly to begin with. So what I have here for my ribbing is a strand of flat metallic French tinsel medium. And what I do is I tie it in first. And that way I know that I can lash this down along the hook shank and not have any bulk built up. And I tie it in the bottom on the far side. So when this fly is rotated around, the material is starting back here and then it's going to come up forward and around. So rotate your vise around if you can or learn to tie materials on in on the bottom. And each thread wrap is touching, spaced, tight, not overlapping, just side by side. And I will stop then down at a point where my thread dangles, I'm right at my hook point. This is the tie-in point for I, where I will tie in my tail. I like to have wax on hand and wax my thread, so I'll just give it a little dab of wax. That will help hold the tail material in. And for the tail, I'm going to choose red hackle fibers. So I have a package of red rooster hackles. And what I want is a nice, straight fiber with a little bit of webbing in it. That webbing gives a little bit of a bulk and color, but I don't want to use a schloppen like feather right here. That's too soft. So something in the middle where around the base of this feather right here. These look like they could be good good tailing fibers. So I'll choose that feather right here. And we'll just strip away what we're not going to need. I'm going to start grooming away a section of these and I want to line those tips up so they're nice and straight. And I will hold them by the tip here and pull that feather away. And then I want to slightly fold these in half, curve side up. And then I measure out my tail length, which should be the length of the body. And here you have a great measuring tool already built in. The beginning of this thread to the end of that thread. If I place my finger right there and measure out the length, then I know I can then tie in right here. I'm going to place those on top, pinching everything in my fingers. 
Here I want to take a soft pinch. The thread is built up into my fingertips in a soft loop, then I pull down lightly. This is a, uh, right here, is just a soft wrap. It's not a distribution wrap or a securing wrap, it's just a soft wrap. A distribution wrap will then move material around the fly. But I want to check to see if my fibers are aligned up on the top. And they're slightly off to the side. If I pull down tight on that thread, now I distributed, distributed the fibers around. Pinch again, and I want one soft, two soft wraps behind, and I come back forward, and now I start to secure tightly. And I'm not trimming away any of this material, because I want to bind it down underneath. I'm showing you this technique now, because this is how I do it on everything. Now granted, I'm going to have a dubbed body on here, and I could be a little sloppier with this, because the dubbing will certainly hide all of that. But for the sake of keeping this fly tidy, I'm going to go tight. What I also want to show you here right now, so that there's a step between the return eye down to the main line of wire. And if I wanted to get fancy with that, I can use the butts of these hackles to fill in that space. And so that way, if I wrap my thread all the way up, and put those butts into that gap, I can then create a smooth, clean surface. So if I look at the top, that step kind of just disappeared. If I was to tie a, a floss body, I would, I would attach my floss here, wind down and back. But for this, we're going to dub it. And then in another episode, we'll get right to the floss body. So let's go ahead and get lazy and spiral our thread back and wax up some thread. I like to use a pretty gummy tacky wax. This is Bet's Wax. I've had this for 24 years now. And I don't think I've ever pushed this up. It's just been lasting me that long. So I wax up a section of my thread and then we will start to dub purple body. You can use a lot of different dubbings if you want. All right, here you have STS Trilobal Dub Purple. It's got a lot of nice shimmer to it. Uh, if you wanted to get more classic, this is Angora Goat or Seal Fur Substitute. Fluorescent Seal, Fluorescent Purple. Um, I have a darker, darker Antron. This is my preference because I, I tend to like the more saturated colors. And um, Ice Dub Purple would work really nice. But I'm going to choose this Angora dub dubbing because it's a little harder to work with so I can show you that process. Pinch out a small amount and I'm just going to start taking small amount and really putting some muscle into this twist. I'm going to work my way down the dubbing loop. And if you need to, you can take a little wax on your fingers and get your fingers kind of waxy and pinch tightly. And at this point, I'm going to do a light, soft wrap help to secure that tail in place. Sometimes it helps to even hold it. And then I'm going to just start working my way forward and smooth even dubbing wraps up to the point where I know I'm going to start tying my hackle in. It's just past the return loop. I'm giving myself some room to work here. I could tie that off pull away the rest. The next step is we're going to spiral our tinsel forward. I tend to pinch right here at the base because I bent that. And if you use metallic tinsel, 
you'll be able to do this. And I'm going to cock it at 15 degree angle or so. I haven't pulled a protractor out and measured it, but it's about a 15 degree angle. You want five wraps of tinsel up the body. And I just hold place my material in place and spiral the vise. And that's how I can get three, four, five. So I can get five good tinsel wraps. Again, metallic tinsel is going to hold its shape. And since I took five turns, I'll unwind. Those of you who use a Norvice, you don't have to worry about unwinding your thread. Thread direction is a very important step that I take when I'm tying. Either I'm wrapping rearward or I'm wrapping forward. When I'm tying this material off, I'm tying rearward. I'm tying back over itself. So that way I can then come in, snip close, And I'll wrap a base around the tag end of that tag of the tinsel on the underneath there. Now at this point in time we're ready to tie our hackle. And the, the selection of hackle I like to find is one that has a little bit of the glossy glossiness to it. Like this one is nice and glossy. And then that glossy should taper out to kind of a webby base like here on this feather but I want to see more of a taper between lengths so the tip of this feather I want to have a shorter length than the butt and that helps create a nice cup shape so I'll sort through this stack of feathers until I find one that you know is ideally suited for what I want to tie this one this one looks pretty good so I've got some glossy tips and then a nice soft webby butt section. And the length of the fibers as I measure it out should extend just to the junction of the tail and the body. Now I don't want to use this whole hackle, but I do want to have a little bit of this stiffer tip in there and I tie that in first to kind of support and hold out the softer, webbier hackle. That I think gives it a little bit more movement and more life underwater as I fish this fly. And I tend to fish with uh, short sink tips in, in riffly water. I like the faster water. Uh, that gives me a chance to fish during the day instead of having to be out there at first light, last light. You'd be surprised at how many steelhead you can pick up in the middle of the day after everybody's left by using a sink tip head, heading to the heavier water. So this fly, I'm going to tie with a stiffer wing and a stiffer hackle than I normally would. Otherwise, when I fish softer water, I might choose to use more of a webby, schloppen-like feather. So for example, on this Winter's Hope, the hackle on the Winter's Hope is two schloppen feathers that have been wound together. And this is a nice, long, webby, fiber and this fly would do well swinging across a slower deeper pool uh, in the winter time. So we'll prepare this red hackle by stroking the fibers out in a way leaving our tip intact and when I was a kid we learned to fold hackle before we tied the fly in and I would sit down and fold a dozen or two hackles getting prepared kind of like what the what chefs call mise in, play, mise in place and so in order if you want a hand fold you can grip your hackle with your second and middle finger leaving your index finger and thumb to kind of pull the fibers back like that folding the hackles like this gives you a chance to wind essentially a bare stem against the hook without binding any hackle fibers down causing everything to lay down nice and neat and what I do is a lot different than I see other people posting on videos is I see a lot of people tie in their hackle from the butt here and wind towards the tip and I don't like to do that because of the tip of this hackle fiber is stiffer stiffer fibers than these soft 
fibers down at the base. So what I want are these stiffer fibers tied in first to hold out the softer fibers of the hackle. So that way when this fly is fished under tension, it's it's got a little bit more bulk and a little bit more animation. So tying flies commercially, I learned to pick up the pace of my tying. You know, obviously this fly is taking a long time to tie because I'm talking to you about the different techniques that I'm putting into it. Um, so what I've had to learn to do is how to do things fast and how to do them efficiently. So what I do is I tie my fly in by or my hackle in by the tip. I'm going to take you know, four wraps forward, four or five forward, and these are securing wraps. It's nice and tight. You can see I'm bending the hook. Take the tip of that hackle and fold it back, and then I'm going to tie some rearward thread wraps. Now that has secured this hackle in there really tight against the top of the hook. So the technique that I use for folding then is I to take my open blade of my scissors and score along the top edge now. Give it a couple of good scores. You can probably hear that noise. And I don't want to cut the fibers off, but you can see now that I've essentially folded everything off to the side. And then I can just use my thumb and forefinger as I wrap each wrap spaced tight against each other forward. Keep folding that out of the way. Usually I, I do anywhere from five to ten wraps. Usually about five or six is all that's needed. And I think I'll do one more here. Because now I have softer, webbier hackle behind the stiffer. So I'll kind of clear myself an area to tie off. I'm tying off on the bottom. I can rotate around. One, two, three, four, five rearward wraps rearward not forward I keep making my next area clean the next step has got to have a clean foundation to work on otherwise you're just building thread on top of thread on top of thread and that's how you end up with these really bulky oversized nasty looking heads on your fly and I don't like fishing flies with big old nasty heads I don't think the fish care but you know I have a sense of aesthetics I want things to be clean and neat and not ugly. But, you know, some people swear by ugly flies. I swear by beautiful flies. So I created a nice little thread base, grooming the hackle as I go. I kind of pinch and twist like that. So I want to start getting this hackle to sit low and clear for my wing. As I rotate this around, you can kind of see what I'm doing there. Now there's a lot of choices for wing material that you can use. Traditionally, I've been using a lot of calf tail. And you can see I've I raped this calf tail if it's good stuff. But, you know, save these tips. These curly, crinkly tips right here are used for tying air BCs and moose turds or other like Bill McMillan waking waking flies. So save those tips for another day. Don't throw them away. You can also, you know, if you've got a piece, throw some polar bear onto it, which is also a very traditional material, hard to come by, maybe questionable about the eth ethics of having it, but it certainly is, you know, if you can get it here in the States, and I've seen it for sale recently, you know, grab yourself some. I tend to use a lot of bucktail. Bucktail is a little stiffer than calf tail, but it's actually more su supple than polar bear. And when it's tied and prepared right, it looks a lot like a polar bear wing. You can use kid goat as well. But I'm going to prepare a bucktail wing. So I'm just going to take a small section of this hair here. And sniff off a pinch of it. I'm going to roll up my fingers so that way I don't have a 
bias or curve. I'm going to pinch off near the ends and flick away any shorter pieces. So now I have all the shorter pieces are out. I have nice long pieces here. Clean out the mess. And then I'm going to insert that into a hair stacker by the tips. Kind of get things stacked in there. Wrap it on the desk a few times. I know your neighbors at the tying shows. I always hear this noise going on. And then remove your hair by the tips. Come back, check. You've got things lined up the way you like it. Any odd hairs. I can get a little better than that. But I'll restack that one more time. There we go. Measure out the length. The length measures to the rear of the hook. And so I want my length to go just to the rear of the hook. So that'll be my length. And come in with my other hand. I'm going to use my right hand to kind of pinch and push this down into place. Transfer possession over to the other hand. And, I'm gonna and then I'm going to take 10 strong wraps. And I'm going to, these wraps are heading rearward. Three, four, five, six, about five or six back. And I'll take about five or six forward. And the goal here is to really get everything in there nice and secure. I don't like to lose possession of my hair while I'm still working with it. So I keep it pinched and then I will come in with my other hand and pull those butt ends up kind of just to make sure they're in there really good. Pull them back, maybe take a few wraps in front of them. But I want to keep those butts nice and secure and uh, under control. Now at this point in time, I'm going to trim this and so I could turn this so you can see. I'm going to pull out that butt end and I'm going to place my scissors in flat against the top of the fly. Not curved at an angle. I want these flat and flush. And in one fail swoop I'm going to give it a snip. And then I'm going to turn the fly and you can see it's kind of a square head. So I'm going to come in and trim a little bit of angle there. I got a little tag in that I don't like. And at that point in time, I'm just going to carefully wrap a small head with lots of tension here, continuing to bind that wing down. And a trick you can do to keep your head nice and small is to untwist your thread. If your thread is starting to spin and become rope-like as opposed to wrapping with floss, you can unspin your bobbin until your thread starts to unwind. And then take the end of your uh, whip finish tool here and I start to kind of burnish that thread just to see if those strands are starting to splay out a little bit. And as this untwists and you do that, you can start to see this thread becoming kind of like a micro floss, nice and flat. And it's when you have a nice section of flat thread outside the bobbin, then you can proceed to create a nice, smooth, clean, whip finished head. And I don't use a lot of tension on my whip finish. I want my thread to slide through, back and forth as I'm wrapping because this whip finish is what is laying down that smooth head. The end of this tool is keeping that thread flat as I wind up a nice little smooth head. And once I have established the head size and shape that I desire, then I can finish off the fly. Liberate the thread and 
cement coat the head of the fly. And with that, you're complete with your classic Del Cooper hair-winged wet fly.